Good morning, everyone. And as Peter said, it, it goes on waves, going to the bigger systems and then going down and zooming in. And we are zooming in on interactions between atoms, between small molecules, or parts of small molecules. And I try to convince you why it's important to understand these processes uh, a fond. Let, let's have a look at an active site of a protein binding to a ligand. And co-crystal structures is one of the uh, a very important tool for us. There are now in the protein data bank more than 100,000 of uh, co-crystal structures of protein ligand interactions. And you see these contacts here. And the questions that we ask, is this the best we can do in this contact? And why is this good? And by that, we have been, in many cases, been able to take a hit to a lead in terms of uh, affinity from the micromolar range to the single digit nanomolar range. And I will take you through some of these interactions. Now, this is a, we pursue a distinct multi-dimensional approach. So this could not be possibly done by one technique. For example, you cannot learn about water with small molecules. You have to have cryo X-ray uh, crystallography. So we're studying protein ligand interactions. But if you want to study an individual interaction, the enzyme is too complex. Still today, since there are too many other factors coming. So there we do the synthetic studies. We're even sometimes using unidirectional systems, and then the crystallography are mentioned, and the database mining. This is only a small part of the big data that, that, are, that are out there, and where we have to learn increasingly to tap into them, not to reproduce things that have already been known, and to take general conclusions. That's a big challenge for both pharma and agro. And when I say pharma and agro, the techniques in both, uh, it, once X-ray crystal structures are there, are the same. So, uh, so uh, in the pharmaceutical industry, structure-based design, based on structural information of ligands, uh, was developed earlier. But now, we have so many crystal structures in fungicide, insecticide, and herbicidal research that we can apply the same techniques to accelerate and make uh, the, the development to, uh, develop, to uh, uh, top lead uh, and accelerate it and make it faster and uh, more efficient. Structure-based ligand design is a, ba a basis of our work and theoretical calculations, which we either do ourselves or that we do if the level goes higher in collaborations. So you see collaborative networks, as almost in all research that is nowadays timely and important collaborative networks have to be installed and they have to work. And I'm very happy that I can report to you from the re results from various collaborative networks that are working incredibly well. So I will, water by the itself would be a lecture. First of all, if, if we would work, if our li living would be in the gas phase, in the vacuum, uh, I wouldn't give this lecture, since everything would be known. It's a solvent that makes everything complex. So we have to understand solvent, and we, we and many, many others put a lot of energy on that. I will show you an example uh, from a protein ligand complexation study where uh, what water has an effect. And then I give you a brief uh, outline on interactions. Some of them you might not have. Uh, been very familiar with, such as halogen bonding, and then fluorine, which was already mentioned. It's good to see increasing f fluorination methods, just like Tobias Ritter yesterday mentioned them, since fluorine is a special atom, as Matthias already coined it. And the last part will be showing you an, yet another important conclusion that came up largely through Matthias Witschel. Uh, namely that herbicidal research has much synergisms with research on protozoa, on prokaryotes, 
and in our case particularly on malaria. Biosynthetic pathways are the same in herbicides, in, uh, in herbs, than they are in these uh, parasites. Different from humans, and that's an ideal basis to, uh, to start. And the hits for these two projects all came out from BSF, high throughput screening, initially targeting crop protection. Now this is the, the enzyme where I want to talk about water uh, with you, and this is a 15-year-old collaboration with Gerhard Klebe uh, in Marburg, and it shows tRNA guanine transglycosylase, but two, two homodimers binding tRNA. What does it do? It's, uh, uh, it substitutes in the tRNA molecule at the vowel position 34, guanine, against in prokaryotes pre-Q1. So guanine go, uh, is sub substituted by this, and then biosynthetic steps lead to q -in. Now we humans also need q -in, uh, presumably for the f f high fidelity of the translational process, but we take it up by food. So it's in our uh, food uptake. So the enzymes are different for the two species. Th basically, uh, tRNA guanine transglycosylase uh, can be inhibiting shigalosis, since in shigalosis you have a, a virulence factor VRF, and if the translation of this virulence factor is inefficient, by blocking T TGT, the bacteria become a pathogenic. Now, how does it do it? And then I stop with the biology, uh, but uh, it has two catalytic aspartates, one nucleo for nucleophilic catalysis and the other for acid-base catalysis. So the nucleophilic displaces the guanine that goes out and then comes under acid-base catalysis comes the pre-Q1 in. And these steps have been beautifully uh, characterized by, by a, a series of crystal structures which have helped very much in the, uh, to design new ligands. Now, if you look here at zoom in into this site, this base exchange site, the catalytic site, here you see the, the nucleobase pocket, and here you see the ribose 34 and the ribose 33 from the tRNA channel. And we want to de design ligands that are competitive against this large tRNA molecule. So as a, good, uh, as a good drug designer, you would st start by filling here with a scaffold and then grow vectors into these two pockets. We started with a, a compound, lin a linearly ex benzo-expanded guanine that Nelson J. Leonard at the University of Illinois in the 70s introduced. And this molecule already is a good ligand. It occupies this... Uh, nucleobase site, and now, what, uh, as I'll show you in a moment, here is another lipophilic pocket, a distinct pocket shaped by two valines and a leucine. And to get there, we want to build a vector to get there, but you see here this water cluster, five water, and, and a very nice water cluster. It's not the usual one that predominates in water, where one water attracts two hydrogen bonds, and gives two hydrogen bonds. But it, uh, and this water cluster solvates efficiently the two aspartates here. And to get through this, it's very difficult since these were predictive free energy calculations by my colleague Van Gunstren at ETH that only two of these waters can be displaced with either in a neutral way or in a gain in energy. Three waters. Uh, will be displaced only at costs. So we put the vectors on, and you see uh, with these polar groups, these ammonium groups, we are getting, we stay neutral. We're replacing, as I show you, water molecules, but we're not gaining anything. It's almost impossible to gain something in such clusters, and th this is not only our finding. But then if we expand 
to here. You see, we're going then from, and, and uh, go into this hydrophobic patch. We're going from 50 nanomolar IC50 to 4 nanomolar. So this is an, uh, so if you know, and this situation is frequent. If you know how to pass a water cluster then, uh, to, to get to another hydrophobic binding site, that's uh, information that is of general value for many projects as illustrated in this one. Here's the crystal structure of the ammonium mine. Three waters are gone of the five, but we have no gain compared to the molecule that has not this side chain. So we only have reduced the ligand efficiency. Now look at this. If we continue then, here is the, the ammonium mine that displaces the waters. And now we, we come to this hydrophobic patch here and the cyclohexyl ring now gains hydrophobic binding energy, desolvation energy, and you go to four nanomolar. We have also gone to, this, to the picomolar range. Ammonium ions are not uh, always good for membrane permeability, especially if they're highly basic. So we have now de developed other t t strategies. We're putting riboses, uh, sugars, in there, and we are, part, we are displacing two waters, you see three are left, uh, by slight loss, but we are currently growing uh, the vector here into this hydrophobic pocket. Now, this is just one study. There are many, and we tried to summarize in the, in the re review dedicated to BSF what you can do with water. If a water has four has four contacts to the protein, so two donor acceptor, or three hydrogen bonds, one polar interaction, dipolar. Just put surface on it. You cannot replace it. It will not be possible. It's, a, it's like a structural water. If you have three waters that have contacts to the protein, you might be able to, to, uh, to replace it, but you will never win. So it will rather cost. These rules are based on many, many... Uh, papers by others and us. If you have two contacts, there you have a good chance to displace the water and then maybe grow and uh, further and gain binding. But just by the displacement of water, as I just had shown you, that's energetically neutral. Here is the important case. If you have one polar interaction, you can replace that water. And as my postdoc, Professor Jack Dunitz, has published in Science, 15 years ago, you can gain two kilocalories, so almost a factor of 100 in binding affinity by replacing such water. Now, the, the second part introduces you some weak keys of molecular recognition. So not the hydrogen bond, not the, uh, uh, the aromatic intera stacking interactions, but very weak interactions. And I start with fluorine. We made in the early 2000s a fluorine scan of inhibitors of the serin protease thrombin from the blood coagula coagulation cascade and found that uh, uh, CF undergoes a very favorable interaction with a peptide backbone carbonyl. Now, if you see such a contact, make sure that it's not just by chance. Atoms have to go somewhere, but do a search in the database, which we did, and we found that these contacts actually are abundant. And they are rather surprising since we all learn in the physical chemistry text that anti-parallel dipolar interactions and head-to-tail dipolar interactions are the best one. Anti-parallel are strong, but the, are the best, but the orthogonal dipolar interactions are as good as head-to-tail. Now, if you look at that, you take here the distance FCO, and if that distance goes uh, down, the FCO angle goes to 90 degree. And increasingly, the CFCO uh, becomes linear. Now, why is that? The, the reason is that this is the way dipoles can interact the best without running into steric hindrance. If you had, had those anti-parallel the residues that are on the carbonyl and the residues that are on the organofluorin would, at, two ang at three angstrom, be in severe Van der Waals repulsion. So it's a steric effect, 
uh, why we see so many orthogonal interactions. Now, is this uh, just academic? No, it is not. This is the successor of Gleevec, the first able uh, ki kinase inhibitor uh, that made by Novartis that made it to the market. And they're in, this, in the uh, second generation compounds that have, uh, I have now started, you see that in the kinase, the DFG loop is in an out conf conformation and it's stabilized by three interactions. Only one is a classical interaction that you would uh, 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 call like that, namely the hydrogen bond here between uh, the, uh, the, 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 the loop and the carbonyl here. That's a classical. This hydrogen bond polarizes the CO to undergo an orthogonal dipolar interaction. And then look at the CF3. The CF3 undergoes a CF orthogonal CO interaction at very short distance. That's what keeps it together. Those interactions before the mid-2000s had never been really used. They have been sometimes established, but not considered. And now these are uh, the multiple contacts that, uh, that drive uh, drug discovery and crop protection agent discovery to a large extent. Protein amide bonds, they are uh, uh, abundant in, in, in proteins, of course, the peptide backbone bonds. And so how, wh what do, uh, how we treat them to gain free energy. And that we learned from another project, another serine protease from the blood coagulation cascade factor 10A. Uh, Xaralto is, uh, uh, from Bayer is a, a successful compound. And it has an onium binding site here, an aromatic box in which cations, pioneered by Dennis Dougherty at Caltech, the cation pi interaction, uh, can bind beautifully or tertiary ammonium ions, which are better for bioavailability. And then we have here uh, such a needle going into the selectivity pocket stacking between two flat peptide bonds. In this work, I show you an, a single atom replacement. If you have the onium ion that binds in this aromatic box, the, you have high binding. If you replace it by an isosteric tertiary butyl, you are at uh, 550. So I like making substitutions of atoms and gaining a factor of 100 or more. In, uh, it's very uh, atom economic, too. Now, what we found in this work is we found different, large differences, the crystals, these are all crystal structure excerpts, between the, the oxazoles, different constitutionally isomeric oxazoles. This one is much better, this is weaker. And we reasoned that the peptide bond, which has a large dipole moment, will interact differently with the dipoles of the oxazoles. Here we have an, uh, and uh, an anti-parallel favorable dipole interaction, and here we have a parallel unfavorable. Can we check that? We do that currently in synthetic systems, and it's val we are validating it, the first paper has come out, but here is an example for a computational study. We, the dipole moment of an N-methyl acetamide as a model for a peptide uh, bond in the protein, 3.7 dB, it's a very high dipole moment. And so we looked at heterocycles, how they stack in two different geometries on this peptide. It's important to, to learn how to address peptides. For example, if you have amyloid fibrils and you want to change their conf conformation, you need to know what to do with these fibrils, and this is one step in this direction. Now, this is our findings on a very high level of theory that comes to, close to uh, correlates perfectly with cup and cluster for the expert. So what we see here are dipoleless molecules, but you see the, the more nitrogens we have, the better the interaction energy. And here, dipoleless benzene, and you go to pyridazine, and you have a strong increase in the interaction energy we, uh, in a good free energy relationship with the, with the dipole moment. So, this, so, so the two ma messages we got is the interaction energy is uh, increasing when the ring stacking on the peptide is increasingly electron deficient. And very recently, not published yet, we found pentafluorophenyl, 
very electron deficient, being really good to interact with peptide bonds. And here is the trend of the dipole moments. You see the dipole moment goes up and the interaction energy goes, uh, increases. And then you can do a computational a rotational scan and there you find that at 180 degrees where the dipoles are, are anti-parallel, you have the best interaction and the potential energy curve uh, shows the best interaction in the expected 3.2 to 3.8 angstrom range. Halogen bonding, that is something where Ole Hassel got the Nobel Prize for in 1970, but it was not called like that. It, but uh, he had done beautiful work on, on and this is what it, uh, it is called uh, in analogy to hydrogen bonding. You have a halogen bond donor and you have an acceptor. And the acceptor needs to interact in a collinear way with its lone pair, a Lewis base, with this uh, uh, sigma hole, which is the sigma star orbital of the CX bond. And it only occurs with higher halides. The lower the sigma star orbital and uh, the, uh, the more electron deficient the substituents are, the bigger the sigma hole. This is a hole that we target with a electron uh, with the lone pair of a Lewis base. And you see even hybridization makes a big difference. What you see from these pictures is also the lone pair have to, has to come here. And it's highly geometry dependent. If the, the lone pair comes here, it gets repulsive with the other lone pairs of the halogens. So the criteria set up by, by a lot of work in small molecule X-ray crystal structures and theory is that the halogen bond donor to the acceptor, this angle has to be close to linear so that the lone pair points into the sigma hole in this electropositive region. The angle here is more flexible, similar to hydrogen bonds. When you have a carbonyl, you have, can have hydrogen bonds in a large conus. And very important, there is covalent bonding involved and the XO distance must be uh, smaller than the sum of the Van der Waals radii. And how powerful this, we just found out recently and published a paper with Oliver Dumele, who is in the audience. We made a capsule based on four C iodine pyridine halogen bonds, which can encapsulate guests. So uh, not only metal supramolecular assembly or hydrogen bonding, but you can make capsules via halogen bonding. But previously, prior to that, we had looked at an enzyme, a cysteine pro protease with a very well-behaved active site, so highly pre-organized active site. And here is an overlay of one of the ligands with the APO enzyme. And you see here this glycine in the S3 pocket that we target with a halogen bond. And this is what you get. You see fluorine, no halogen bond, actually unfavorable, 340 nanomolar, and you go down to chlorine, 22, bromine, 12, iodine, 65. We gain, again, close to a factor of 100 through halogen bonding compared to the uh, hydrogen. And uh, we solved all the crystal structures, Dave Banner at Roche at that time, and you see here the halogen bond uh, uh, of iodine to the carbonyl, 3.1 angstrom. That's 0.4 angstrom lower than the, uh, uh, dis the distance uh, of the, the sum of the Van der Waals radii. I shall show you some more. Bromine, and here you see something. Water stays on. Indeed, water that solvates a carbonyl is not replaced, it's displaced. And the carbonyl can get the best of the two worlds. It keeps a hydrogen bond and it gains a halogen bond. That is a very uh, important insight. And fluorine moves away. Fluorine hates the lone pairs of the oxygen. So uh, there is no sigma hole here. And this is all possible due to ligand design where a little pucker of a pyrrolidine moves the iodine compound in towards the glycine whereas it moves the fluorine out without changing the, in this part where the puckering occurs, 
five member drink packer and have no costs and we don't change the protein ligand binding. So this, uh, this is an illustration of what we get out by studying in depth uh, weak interactions. And at the end I show you two projects and I mentioned the word ne network already and you see the network, the seed coming from BSF and the also in the continuation, the cell-based assays and animal studies uh, from the Swiss Tropical Institute, uh, further synthetic uh, forces, the assaying by Mar Professor Markus Fischer who is in the audience and his, his group and uh, one of the fathers of this whole pathway is Adelbert Bacher, uh, um, who, who uh, ex uh, elucidated all the enzymes in the pathway after they had been found by Romer and by Arigoni. So this is a non-mevalinate pathway. The biosynthesis of isoprenoids can produce, uh, occur in two ways. In humans, it's a mevalinate pathway, and you all know HMG CoA uh, uh, reductase, which uh, Lipidor uh, is an inhibitor of uh, all the statins to get the isoprenoids. But the, in plants, you have both. In the cytoplasm, you have the mevalonate pathway, and in the chloroplast, you have the non mevalonate pathway. And in protozoa, or the mycobacteria tuberculosis, or uh, plasmodium falciparum, you have exclusively the non mevalonate pathway. And these synergisms are fantastic. So when something is a hit in uh, on Arabidopsis thaliana, it's a good chance that uh, it, uh, we also have powerful uh, antiparasites, and this has been developed, really, this idea and pursued by Matthias Fitchell. Now, here's the pathway. It has seven enzymes. It has been validated by compounds that have made it into the clinic, and we're looking at an enzyme for which no inhibitor uh, had been made. Actually, our group produced for five of the four of these enzymes the first inhibitors. And it started with Arabidopsis thaliana, ISPD, the homodimeric protein, and here we see an, an overlay of the active site. Here is a substrate, the cytidine diphosphate methyl erythritol, and you see here a, a very characteristic uh, ion pairing between a glutamate and a an, uh, guanidinium, but when the right compound is, is uh, soaked, this goes up and we get a new pocket. We could never have designed this pocket. We didn't see it. We only saw it when we got the crystal structure. So this compound from the BSF library uh, bound, opened up this allosteric pocket, which presumably is an instrument of regulation by downstream products of the pocket, possibly IPP and DMAPP, but that's not yet established for for sure. And so we, we fill this pocket, 140 nanomolar, and here you see again a water. Now this water, that's a candidate for displacement. And so what, what did we do? Don't, if you have an arginine, don't put a carboxylate there. You see our activity almost died. Yet we got, uh, Wolfgang Höfgen got the crystal structure. And, uh, but when we put a nitrile here, we got a, a compound which also showed some nice herbicidal activity. Another lead from the BSF library were the pseudolins. They are marine natural products, highly halogenated compounds, very amazing compounds, and they also bind to this allosteric pocket, but in a different way. They bind uh, chelating a metal ion, which can be a, a zinc or, or for the crystal structure, a cadmium, and also in the cell-based assay show a plasmodium activity. Now let's have a look at the binding since we're talking here molecular recognition. Here is a cadmium ion and, and it's chelating to the pyrrole and the phenol here. And look at that. The other major interaction in the crystal is a halogen bond and there are so many halogenated marine natural products, 
I think we will see many more of those. Here, a halogen bond. And now, in this system, when it, uh, we tested this, this can no longer establish a halogen bond since there is no more ha halide here. And it is chelating, but in the crystal we find 70 to 30, so almost one to one. This conformer and the other conformer where the, the ligand gives up the chelation uh, where the halogen bond is ex established. You see, the interactions that we exploit come back in our projects and we can use them. The last short story is on pyrazolopyrans, inhibitors of serine hydroxymethyltransferase, which also were in the, in the beginning. Now we have further expanded with all the biology and biostructure is done in Thailand at, with collaborators, fantastic scientists at Mahidol University. We get now through the MMV, which is the Gates Foundation Medicines for Malaria Venture, we have access to with various labs to get PKPD, all the APME properties, and uh, so and we, we even get synthesis funded in India through this organization. Now, this is folate metabolism. It's a cycle that most of you are familiar, that the hydrofolate reductase, one of the targets for antibiotics, and there are malaria agents on it. And so this, uh, the parasites actually have to prepare pteridine and the dihydrofolate, whereas we take dihydrofolate up by uh, food. And uh, here, these enzymes are well inhibited, but this enzyme here that forms a bridge here between the two nitrogens, serine hydroxymethyltransferase, there's no inhibitor prior to our work in, in the literature. It's a homodimer again, it's depending on PLP. I will not go uh, too much into that. And these pyrazolopyrans were initially discovered through the high throughput screening, micromolar, optimized for herbicidal activity against Italiana to nanomolar. And then we, we prepared an additional series of compounds and got then on plasmodium falciparum uh, compounds with EC50 cell-based assay values of one nanomolar. Uh, and also target assay done in Thai Thailand. We got the crystal structures, which is now the basis for the new second round of design. We see here the pyrazolopyran cycle very nicely embedded in diverse hydrogen bonding and polar contacts. And here is a more hydrophobic area. That's a para amino benzoate channel of uh, the hydrofolate. Now, why are these compounds so interesting? they show undiminished activity against uh, resistant strains of plasmodium, where most drugs are resistant. And if you read the last year only, Nature Science, New England Journal of Chemistry, and you see how the, the resistance against artemisinates has moved from Vietnam to Cambodia and now to Myanmar, that I've canceled my vacation in Myanmar for, uh, for January. Uh, it's too much. So we, have, we maintain full activity. We have very low cytotoxicity. We also have a, a activity on the liver, not only on the blood stage. We have still to optimize the metabolic half-life since the, a drug should only be delivered once. And this is not such a concern uh, in, in such a case, but we also try to get a better selectivity against Asia. SHMT. I think I could show you just a glimpse how essential water is and that the rules, you don't have to buy a $150,000 progr uh, program water map from Schrödinger. Just let your uh, good in chemical intuition work and, and the rules that I just showed you and that are published in our review. The orthogonal dipolar interactions have put fluorine on the map for not only tuning ATME and PK properties, but also assuring selectivity and binding affinity. Since if a fluorine shows in a pi system in a cross binding to another enzyme, it's very bad. So it's not only what you gain by fluorine, but it's also what you lose. 
the uh, stacking on heterovariants uh, makes a contribution to how to deal with all these fi fi fibrilloids like uh, uh, the amyloids. The halogen bonding rivals clearly and is superior as an interaction. Sorry, what did I do? My I, I w w wiped out my own conclusion. So halogen bonding is really an interaction that is the interaction of the future in synthetic systems, in, in uh, pharma and crop protection science. And then uh, this, all this knowledge greatly benefits these developments that we pursue at BSF in, in plant science. The, there are, and one of the major findings for me which comes from, from BSF and the lab of Matthias Fitchell is the synergism between herbicides and antiparasite drugs. And in, I'm grateful for the company that they, the side, guide, uh, side chain to the parasites that, that also has support so that we can, until we pick up the big support so, soon, hopefully for development. I would like to thank all these collaborative networks co-workers, partners for uh, uh, wonderful work and I li would like to thank you for inviting me here and giving me the opportunity to show you the relation between crop protection science, molecular recognition and uh, anti-parasite development and uh, thank you for your attention. BASF. We create chemistry.